Hello, welcome to another edition of Backstage. We've got another absolute cracking guest. Uh, he's a household name in the world of cycling. Uh, he's won the stages of the Tour de France four times, five times at the Vuelta, and he's a stage winner at the Giro. Uh, he's an award-winning author, and he's quite an intellect. Uh, I think it might have something to do with the schools he went to growing up. Uh, he joins me now from Spain. It's David Miller. David, uh, welcome, mate. Um, just off the top, did you win awards for those books? I just threw that in there just to beef um, up the intro. Yeah, no, no, I did. I, for the first one, I was robbed. Um, I got th- third in the actual. That was the sports book of the year. So that was that was gutting. And you know who won it? I think it was Taylor Hamilton's book that year. I oh, know it wasn't. Oh, yeah. It wasn't. No, 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 it wasn't. It was wasn't. Thank God, I just made that up. I guess <laughs> it was just, no. It was. Um, it was uh, actually. It was a really good book. The one. It was about the suicide of a tragic suicide of a footballer so that's yeah right, right. um yeah. and then I, then I did win cycling book of the year for my second book the racer in 2015 so or 2016 yeah so I did you you're working on any other books at the moment mate um i suppose i am because as my wife will always take the piss out of me my books are always about myself so i guess just by living life at the moment i'm trying to accumulate uh I feel like there's a lot going on in the last, a lot's happened and a lot going on that in another few years will probably be the kind of third and final book of kind of my journey through life. And then I might pluck up the courage to write something else. But at the moment, I'm kind of just trying to live it rather than kind of, uh, how would I say, recount it. Not ready yet. Mm. Mate, um, we haven't seen each other in the flesh. Oh, geez, I reckon the last time I was saying off air would have been at the crepe joint in Girona. And I reckon after that conversation, I thought we had the whole world's issues uh, solved. Um, obviously, there's a few more issues going on in the world at the moment. Um, what, what's, uh, how, how are you handling the whole pandemic uh, over there in Spain? Well, yeah, I mean, as you kind of it's sent me before, told me before, it's kind of on a scale between one being super shit and kind of 10 being absolutely loving life. I kind of, the weird thing is a, a bit of both, actually, uh, because, it, I mean, it's been very stressful because like anyone, it's, it's meant that I don't, I haven't had my usual income coming in. And, uh, I, but then, that's the kind of the pragmatic and the practical and the same thing that the majority of the world is going through. Mm. But then at the other side, at the 10 being just absolutely loving it, was this is the longest I've ever spent in one place since I was 13. So it's been, and that with three young kids, I've got an eight-year-old, a seven-year-old, and a uh, four-year-old, little baby girl. She acts like 15. But, <laughs> um, uh, and I've just got to, it fell into this lovely routine that I've never had, morning walks. Lockdown was the most blissful thing i think we've ever encountered you know it was like all of a sudden the world stopped and mm. we live in a, a farmhouse in the country in, in this little valley and there was no nothing no, there were no longer planes flying overhead there was no buzzing the distance of vehicles on the roads there was nobody around and it felt like we had the world to ourselves and that was just something i don't think we'll ever forget and you know, it, it like, could happen again. There's no doubt about that. But I think that first time we'll always treasure. That's the thing, like, uh, particularly in Spain, if you're living in town, um, people obviously living on top of themselves. And during a pandemic, I mean, that's obviously a nightmare scenario. But having all that extra space, I mean, how many times were you, you saying to your wife, how good is this, like being remote? Oh, every morning. I mean, it was something, and the irony is that probably about seven years ago, I, I know it's over a decade now, um, I'd never lived in the country like this and my wife had wanted to. So we rented a house to check it out and I, I kind of got it. And since then, I mean, I love it. I've been a complete convert to, to country living and just isolation, essentially. I kind of, I, I already self-isolate. I, I kind of, I, whenever I'm back in Drona, I don't go into the Drona bubble ever if i go in and see people i try to not do the stop and chat i i'm just kind of a little bit weird like that now so actually isolation suits me down to the ground (laughs) do you think do you think a lot of people are going to struggle once the pace kicks back in again because we are used to this really slow pace of living nowadays yeah completely i mean i i tell you what here's a weird one having been an ex-professional cyclist we're probably more adept to it than other people in the sense that we've been on training camps we've spent a lot of time on our own and and we're generally a little bit weird as it is but 
I think for a lot of people, so we're used to a dipping in and out. Anybody, and you've been down to like altitude mm -hmm. training camps and things where it's just so boring. There's nothing mm -hmm. going on. It's like you do feel isolated. And but you, once you settle into that rhythm, it's lovely. And and that's it's another weird one. One of the things I've noticed since retiring from being a cyclist is actually I look back with nostalgia on training camps uh, and the simplicity of them. And, and I think lockdown's been a bit like that. I mean, granted, because we had the privilege of space, but what does, what was really hardcore here was, as you said, the majority of the population in Spain do live on top of each other. It's a very urban population and very, they, they tend to spend a lot of their life outside. And so their houses and apartments are just really for basics. Um, and there, there were children that were stuck inside for nearly two months mm. and, it's just savage, and that's going to leave traces. I'm sure of it. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's been it's, it's been intense. I remember um, I used to walk the streets and see um, kids playing on swings at like ten thirty, eleven at night, and it's yeah. normal over there. And you're like, hey, like in Australia, yeah. if kids are up past seven thirty, people are almost calling human services, you know. Yeah. Um, but it's just a norm over there. So yeah, I think you're right. Like the the whole lockdown. Um, we can delve into a little bit later, but I think the mental health side of things is is really going to rear its ugly head at some point, um, for sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I saw. I mean, I'm sure she won't mind me saying. My wife, she's really struggled with coming out of lockdown and back mm -hmm. into just the the you kind of you're doing stuff that you you realise during lockdown that actually you can strip life down to fair basics and be very content. And I think it's then all of a sudden you find yourself forced back into the proverbial rat race. And you do mm. question why, why do we live like this? Um, so, yeah, yeah, you're right. I think there's going to be some, and it's, it's whether the repercussions could be negative, they could be positive, they're going to be both. And as you said, I think mm. it's, a, it's a mixture between you have moments that being super shit house and other moments that just being absolutely blissful. And it's, mm. uh, it's something that we've never experienced before. And I think we, we're going to experience again. So what we're finding here in Melbourne is we're on the well, we're going through a second wave. Um, they've just made all face masks um, mandatory and, and things like that. Um, it's actually a bit worrying now that they're about to start the cycling season again, and we still don't know enough about this virus and how like infectious it is. You know, you literally just get one droplet in that in that peloton and kaboom. Um, mm. What what are your thoughts on the revamped cycling calendar? How do you think it's going to pan out? Mm, how do I think it's going to pan out? I think it's going to be it's going to be interesting. I mean, I, there's a part of me that thinks it's a fabulous case study for what the season could be. Mm -hmm. um, is that kind of that that condensing it down, and it's a it could be a proof of concept. I mean, I mean, let's be honest. The only reason it's happening is is for economic reasons, like the way that things do get reopened early, because a lot of these race organisers they will lose their their sponsorship if it doesn't happen. And also, let's not forget the actual kind of the the complexity of closing down roads and mm. uh, the actual ministerial requirements and local council and county requirements. Now, if they go one year without it, they might not authorise it again the next year. Mm. So they, they have to get these races going this year, whatever happens, uh, for many reasons. And one of them is there is the chance that one year without the next year, they won't get the authorizations because now it's been done. They've done it a year without it. So there is that, there will be that fear. I mean, I was already seeing that Milan San Remo is already taking a beating from all the, the, the local towns that it's going to pass through on the Riviera because it's going to be the height of summer. And, mm. you know, and it's, they haven't had tourism for six months. And then in the, on August the 8th, on a weekend, they want to shut down all the roads. It's kind mm. of sort of, sort of an uproar. So you can see how these things happen. Um, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm fascinated to see it. I think it's going to be great. Um, but at the same time, it's going to be weird watching the classics in the height of summer. It's, um, and it's going to be super weird watching Grand Tours where there's no, there's no form guide. Mm. Um, is going into it kind of Freddie fresh legs. It's going to, yeah, it's going to be good racing. Um, I think obviously the cycling model, you, you bang your head against the wall for years thinking, you know, how is this financially sustainable for a lot of these teams given that, you know, they can't, there's no revenue streams for these guys other than sponsors. You know, they don't get a slice of the TV stuff and it's it's really old school compared to other mainstream sports like F1 and so forth. Um, how many teams do you think even if they race the rest of this year, really going to struggle um, to to remain viable um, moving into next year if the, if it all goes 
uh, to plan? I haven't really thought about the actual kind of statistics of it. I mean, my gut feeling would say 75% of the teams are going to be in deep trouble. Um, mm. uh, and as you said, the revenue model simply is it's anomalous to what professional sport should be in that there is no uh, sharing of TV rights. And that's just simply because of the the whole, um, how would I put it? Uh, it's a very, it's just, it's, it's just all over the place, isn't it? It's like, cause it's so many different organizations. There's no unified, mm. UCI is supposed to be the unifier, which is what you have with most professional sports. They will either be nationally based and have a national league. So we don't have a national league. The closest you get to a national league is ASO and they're France, but they do own some races in Belgium and now in Spain as well, the Tour of Spain. And they are the cash cow and they don't need to share it because they, they own the rights to the sport in many ways. UCI similarly. Um, but I think with the teams, uh, I, often, and we both know this, it's borderline philanthropy. Mm. You, you, it's a passion project by an individual rather than a, a board of directors who have made a calculated, rational decision, which does happen very occasionally. But often, and you look at almost through every single big team in cycling, there's one person behind it who is essentially uh, the money, and they're doing it out of love for the sport. And they're not doing it for um, any calculated uh, return, if you like. There's no ROI in a professional cycling team, put it that way. Mm. Um, do you think that, uh, all right, say worst case scenario, you know, half the teams look like they're going to fold. Do you think it's going to force the hand of, um, all the organisers to come together and say, well, hey, we, we're going to have to revamp this structure because there's no future like at a, at a world tour level if something isn't done. I think the, bigger, the biggest battle is who starts that conversation? Um, how does that collectively have a voice? Because even among the pro teams, you've got ones that are almost controlled by ASO because their sponsors – are found like your confidences and that like they're not going to arc up. So I I don't know how that's going to happen. Um, well, I mean, often and this is often what happens in cycling because of the very nature of the beast in the sense that it has got no uh, solid infrastructure. The foundation of it is based on history and historical behaviour, and also that's what ASO. That's why ASO have been genius. They bought the history. Mm. So they owned the biggest race in Tour de France, but then they started. And this is where I, I think we should always be cautious. I, I know a lot of people will just vilify ASO as the bad guys, but professional cycling essentially wouldn't exist as it does now without them. Um, mm. and, and in many ways, they, they've been philanthropic because uh, they pick up the races. And in hindsight, you'd go, oh, look at them. They're just building their own calendar. Well, actually, they picked races up which were about to die. So that could have been Paris-Nice, Criterion de Dauphiné, the Volta Espana, liege Bastogne, liege Flesh Wallonne, Paris-Roubaix. And that's just the big ones. They've got a multitude of other smaller ones as well. And they bought those because they were about to collapse and die. So, and then they brought in the ASO structure and revamped them. And, and I've been in meetings with the US, UCI, because back in the day when I did all that sort of thing, with um, Jean-Francois Pechou, who used to be the technical director for the, um, the Tour de France and ASO as a whole. And they were building, uh, if you like, for the world to uh, what we're referring to as a road Bible of how every race should be organized. And this was going back to the fact that there was a huge disparity between the, the final three kilometer rule, how races were actually the caravans were managed. I mean, you've seen it, Dan. You go to an RTS race, it's fucking chaos. You go to an AS, AS race, it's military organization. Yeah. And so, well, actually what the UCI did, they brought in the ASO to, to build, and Jean-Francois Pechou, uh, in person in his year the year following his retirement from ASO to spend a year two years building this road bible that every single race organizer had to adhere to and obviously he did it but they haven't been able to apply it because then the race organizers don't have the funds to have five people five commissaires on motorbikes or these different things mm -hmm. and and just don't have the actual discipline and will and experience to apply it so ASO do actually kind of they run the sports they run the best races and they now own the best calendar and in many ways, I don't think it would be a bad thing if they just went around and picked up the rest of the races. You know, it's yeah, I was going to really say, like, what, they'll get him on the cheap. Like, uh, you know, as you said, if these races are going to fall over, I mean, why don't they, yeah, just, just create their own calendar? Yeah. And then that way, they could build a model. Like, you look at the NBA. Um, mm. If you do like a – it's all about TV and entertainment and watching everything on your phones now. They could do some sort of subscription model where, you know, a, a dividend of that is paid back to the teams, but you've got to have that unified calendar under the yeah. one banner, yeah? 
Yeah, you need to have it's, it needs, and you know, this is and this is what we spoke about, Jonathan, the last time we were together. And this is the thing that's always blown my mind, and and this was from uh, working on a couple of movies and then working with a lot of people in that industry and then also a lot of the work I did the CPA and UCI and different things is that one of the fa and you just you just said it there it's about entertainment now you want uh, entertainment to be um, easy for the viewer the consumer to understand and you want it to have a consistency and at the moment there is no consistency to the viewing experience of cycling uh, there is no the production values are still low and they they could be infinitely better. You look at what um, uh, what they did with the America's Cup. Now the America's Cup is the dullest thing in the in the world to watch, if you like. But they managed to, with obviously with huge resources and a will, they managed to make it one of the most exciting thing in the world to watch. Now cycling is exciting to watch, but at the same time, it's essentially still built on the same production values of when TV was first introduced in the nineteen sixties, fifties, with it's like three motorbikes, two cars, maybe three fixed cameras, two helicopters, and that's it. Mm. Now, and that's that's a grand tour stage at the Tour de France is five motorbike cameras. Uh, I think it's gonna have probably five fixed cameras and two, two TV helicopters, and that's it. Mm. And you think that's insane. You know, it's, they could be, they don't, and the thing is they don't need to invest more into those production values because it works. No one's asking for more and they own it. <laughs> All yeah. the people back in Australia going, oh, how good's that chateau? They don't. That's one bloody helicopter, mate. <laughs> <laughs> they got simple oh, yeah. needs. Hey, simple hey, needs. I'll, I'll tell you this little story about that. Is um, <laughs> so I'm a TV commentator, obviously now for um, ITV, the British uh, broadcaster, and so we have all the multitude of screens when we're commentating. Me and Ned Bolting, like, uh, the commentator, I'm the co-commentator. <clears throat> And French TV, we always have the French TV on feed, the, the France 2, because they've got, they've got a totally different, their director has a lot more access to cameras than we do, because we only get kind of what we get sent. So we're essentially getting the French director's feed. And we can, we, they can't do much with it. There's three or four cameras, but we can. But what happens is when you get to that helicopter shot of the chateau, the bastards at French TV, they have a whole team of people that are there. Their only job is to do the history side. And I can uh, hear it and I can, and I can switch to French TV audio and all this background music comes on. And so while we're getting just that really long panning shot, actually what's happening there is they're cutting in with drone shots, with music, with this person whose only job is to commentate and talk about the history of that chateau. And it's just like, and we're just left there with this crappy commentator's book <laughs> and, and a paragraph of a bad translation trying to make it up as we go along. And I just sit there just watching, just going, you bastards. <laughs> <laughs> but but I, I, I actually think that, um, I mean, people in the UK are probably the same. They probably wouldn't want too much info because then it borderlines, hey, hey hang on. This guy sounds like a bit of a know-all, you know. If you, if you keep it really simple, yeah. like you, you know, I'll oh, look at the peaks. Jeez, that looks old. That's yeah. what, 1600s? That's a, that's all we need, man. Or how good is that pool out the back? They're yeah, always 12th century. Yeah. So um, just on that, how's, how's the whole COVID situation affect your job? Are you going to be there live or are you going to do it remotely? Nah. I just heard, our, heard last week that because actually ITV were pushing to get Ned and I on the road in, in France. And we were totally happy with that because as long as we're kind of taken care, we should be okay. But actually, they've decided now not to. So we'll do it from London. Um, but actually, what's really interesting is we're going to do the Criterium de Dauphiné from here in Girona. So Ned's coming across, uh, which again, this is what I'm loving. This is another proof of concept. If we can, now I get with commentary, you're much better being on the ground because you get insights you wouldn't get otherwise. And not just from word on the street, but actually, because Ned and I will jump on our Bromptons and ride the last 20, 30 Ks every day. You see things that the book doesn't tell you. So there, there is certain, there's a huge advantage to being on the ground, but actually at the same time, these days, we watch the whole race from TV anyway locked in a little cupboard and you think well maybe we can find better ways of doing that and more effective where it's not as because it's stupid we at the tour de france we don't get to our hotels till 10 11 o'clock every night mm. and which is fine because it's the job because we skip so people that aren't aware of how it works uh, as a commentator that works in the what's the media park which is just next and behind the finish line there's this insane 
insane kind of complex of a mobile complex of trucks and cables and basically every single broadcaster is there and it's a it's a, it's an amazing thing to behold but um we go there that ships out after the race finishes they start taking that down immediately that then transfers uh, and arrives to the next finish town about 1 a.m 2 a.m they spend the night building that up in the meantime we leave about an hour and a half after the race and drive to the next finish town so we're always one stage ahead um, so it actually becomes this really weird one where we can do three weeks in the tour and see the race twice in real life mm. because actually we don't actually ever see it in real life and this is a big mountain stage and we're off air and we can go out to the barriers and watch some of the back the, the kind of the back markers come through so i'm perfectly happy to to do it remote um and it'll be interesting to see how that comes across there so how many media on the ground will be there like in the past, I mean, the media scrums were famous. I used to love getting tackled in there when Cadell was winning the tour and hip and shoulder and the Yanks and all that sort of yeah. stuff. It's going to be weird because, like, who's going to be there at the finish line to do the interviews and that? You know what? That's a, that's a great kind of thought because this is one of the things about professional cycling. One of the things I've always loved about it is this absolute um, amateurism. In that sense, and it, <laughs> it's yeah. like running of the bulls. It is literally like a pandemonium. And oh, yeah. if you're if you're stocky like me, and you got this weedy little French guy with his big camera, I mean, it's <laughs> game over, mate. Stocky, it's game Aussie, over. Just put your hand on their face. Yeah. But it, yeah. And this is actually if you if you kind of do if you switch it from what it's like for us and the viewer, etc. It's not much. It's probably for a lot of the people that work in that situation, it's better. But for the riders who obviously will uh, and you know understandably complain and whinge about the kind of uh, that and actually how it's all become so uh how to say neutered these days because the riders will just rush back to their bus and then their media liaison will manage it and these sort of things it's very rare to get those really raw um interviews because everything's so firewall these days but i think for the riders it's going to be really weird because all of a sudden it's going to feel like they're back at an amateur race Mm -hmm. because that's part of the you're at the tour because there are those scrums there is that attention and it's and part of his part of the game is that that kind of oh it's so hard so it's, and you're getting all that attention and it's like and it's they're not going to be getting much attention and no. and you're like oh this is going to be interesting i wonder how nice they're going to be to media when they come back because you know one other thing is, remember there was um, when they planned the route, they'd say we literally can't have a stage finish on that climb because we can't fit all the trucks at the finish line. They could have redesigned, like say, okay, say COVID doesn't piss off and this time next year we're in the same situation. But if they've got like a quarter of the amount of trucks needed at the finish line, you could design a pretty crazy route given that you don't need that space at the finish. Totally. I mean, I, that's, yeah, I hadn't thought about that either. It's, it's basically you could create the Vuelta because mm. that's what they do. And they just go into fucking like goat parks <laughs> and into, into farms. <laughs> yeah. But, um, but uh, yeah, and it's, uh, that's why I think it's, it's going to be a really interesting case study and a proof of concept. And, and I guess this is also, I suppose, part of, I, I, as I was just talking about that chaos of that media village at the tour, maybe that's a thing of the past. Maybe because mm. a lot of broad, it's a it's a fucking big budget. It mm. really for it's the biggest any broadcaster puts into any cycling race. For many, the only cycling race they invest in in the year. Now, if if they can do it and get the same or if not more viewing figures by having their whole team on the ground, they're like at at, at home. Mm. They might go. Actually, we don't need to send you guys this year. It's like, yeah. this is where it's fine. And then all of a sudden, the tour becomes a very different thing because the energy just reduces hugely. Well, what you're finding as well is like all these people that are forced to work from home here in Melbourne, like, you know, they're used to going into the concrete jungle in the corporate offices. They're, they're becoming as productive. So they're going, shit, we don't, we don't need to rent that anymore. And, and it's happening across the board. So it's, it, as you said, it's going to be interesting because particularly given how global the Tour de France is and all these people having to fly over accommodation, all that, as you said, if the, if the product doesn't drop off too much, yeah. But um, this actually, actually just just finish on that one. What's what's really interesting about it is if you think about it, it's because I've I've had these philosophical conversations about kind of uh, about virtual reality and, and gaming and why you. But uh, that's a totally separate thing. But if you if you get to the point of the Tour de France existing, but no media being there and uh, crowds being less, it's still a Tour de France. But is it 
still the Tour de France because the part of the point we call it the circus because it just became so crazy and big and then all of a sudden it becomes this quieter thing it's like hmm does it still mean the same so they're, yeah they're, they're still going to have crowds out on the roads though yeah like they can't really enforce people on the climbs uh to not go is that is yeah. that what's happening or what are they going to do there I, I i have no well we've seen i mean i've seen something uh, the last few years is because of uh because of the big terrorism attack in nice a few years ago where the truck went down a promenade mm. uh and then there were other uh, terrorism threats etc as a, as we'd seen before COVID, that was the big kind of uh the, the elephant in the room the, but what they started doing was closing down city centers and last year at the, on the final stage in paris it, i've never seen anything like it they had taken 500 meters away from the finishing straight in the champs was totally blocked off with huge concrete blocks along the road. And you'd have um, police there and it was checks. And they were doing that with every every Finnish town. They did the same, but most Finnish towns it was 50 meters, 100 meters. And I thought, oh, this is sad because mm. part of the vibe was just the fact it was free. It was just, uh, you could drop by and Pete's never have known it existed and be there. And that's where the energy came from. Yeah, so now it's a, you're a fan going there, you're having to go through all this inconvenience. You kind of get there, you're a little bit on edge. A lot of the joy that was part of the Tour de France viewing experience is, is slowly being evaporated. And I fear that might be what happens next in the sense that if you're going, you're gonna to have to commit yourself to even more inconvenience than, than there was before, because mm. you're gonna to have to go through checks and it could start to put people off. And all of a sudden, it does become uh, less and less people watching. And also, um, like in the past, riders obviously got a bit edgy when fans got too close because, you know, they might throw a bag of piss on them or whatever on a climb. But you think now in a pandemic, how yeah. much are you going to freak out like when people want a bottle? Well, I mean, used to love telling those guys to fuck off, but imagine now. Yeah, we've seen riders, how many riders have we seen getting spit, they get spat at in the face? mm you know, I mean, that's you get arrested for that now. Whereas before, they couldn't really arrest you. No. You know, so now that's actually that would be a criminal offence to do that, and mm. would be prosecuted as such, because it would be kind of GBH essentially. So it's a you know all of a sudden that's what I mean. There's this whole different edge to it all now. It's mm. it was so, and we'll look back probably within the next two years of the Tour de France, just three years ago, and go, wow, what an insane event that was. Mm. It was that made no sense. Um, so yeah, it's interesting. We'll talk about opportunities in a crisis. Imagine if you were that one rogue guy that got a press pass for the tour this year that could be at the finish line, because that's oh. always been the issue of I, I've got to make my call, man. Do I go with Cadell or do I go Robbie? Because they can't get both. You know, they're going to have the scrum and they're going to go on the bus. If you're that one, if you're that one guy. <laughs> you, it's a smorgasbord. Imagine if you're that one guy that just got it by luck and you got a YouTube channel. Yeah. It's like, dude, you're going viral. <laughs> just, oh, just, go out, just going out there. But the thing is, in all riders, we stopping looking yeah. for him. That's yeah. the thing. Be, like, mate, you oh, want to grab? There's a queue of them. But the like, even even I was thinking, um, the old school oh, journos dude. that used to love those dictaphone recorders, and yeah. you know, they'd just be right in your face. I mean, you, they're going to have to get grabs via like boom poles and long sticks. <laughs> They'll need like four or five. Yeah, booms to catch them all. Yeah, it's yeah, just going to be weird. Oh, yeah, um, weird. Have you chatted much to any of the the current riders? And do you get a sense of is there any riders that are a bit on edge? Uh, you know, riding in the current conditions, or do you think most of them are like, all right, look, you know, the the protocols are, are, are pretty much you know protecting us, and and they don't foresee any sort of issues. Uh, no, I haven't actually really spoken to. Unfortunately, I've, I've kind of got to that point now. I'm, I'm 43, where there's almost none of the riders that race now are, are in my generation. And although I live in Girona, I don't really know any of them anymore, sadly. Uh, so no, but I, I just knowing from the temperament and pro bike riders, they're fairly risk averse, and I think it's also there. It's they'll be one, they'll be dying to race, you know. And it's and I guess that they know that everyone's going to have to do their best. And, and I guess that's just becoming part of life, isn't it? It's, you just have to trust. You've got to do the right thing and you've got to trust the people around you are doing the right thing. 
and and that's it otherwise we are going to come to a standstill but obviously i think there will it will be interesting to see because we've and it's good opportunities for riders to actually show solidarity mm. which is always, it's always the the hurdle the peloton collapses at the first hurdle is not showing solidarity so i think if something does happen then they better show solidarity to actually prove it because there is a habit of that not happening but who knows i mean we saw a bit of paris nice which was the final race that was running um, when it was starting to all kick off before lockdown began. And arguably that went on too long. You know, it was still, the whole of France was getting locked down and Paris-Nice was still being raced. And that's just, that sums up pro cycling. Mm. Hey, just before we wrap up the chat about the current day stuff, um, how do you find the, the commentating gig? Um, I know chatting with Matt Keenan and Robbie McEwen, sometimes, um, you know, some of the feedback can be quite direct. Um, they took over from Phil and Paul and, and yeah. you know, they'll criticise for that. But h- how do you go with, with that role and, and feedback from the punters? Yeah, well, f- funny enough, we took over from Phil and Paul as well, um, which was which was hugely daunting because IT, they, ITV Channel 4, that's where I watched it as a kid for the first time. And as we all know, any, any Anglo-Saxon that got into cycling in the last 30 years yeah, 40 years, basically, Phil Liggett is the voice of cycling. So you kind of come into it knowing, oh, shit. And we took yeah. a lot of flack for two days in 2016, which is the first year Ned and I took over. And then, I'll, I'll be honest with you, we get really good feedback, thank God. <laughs> so it's like... Oh, well, that's good. Uh, and, it's only, and it's only when I, um, I make some stupid historical mistakes, because I'll just go in, I'll just dive in. Uh, and that's, that's kind of good, because it keeps it real. But apart from that, now I, I, and, and I enjoy it. I, I it's it's kept it's been like a halfway house when you kind of you leave prison and you got to go into the free world. Um, mm. And commentary has been my halfway house in that respect. And it kept me because I wouldn't have ever watched racing again for many years. And I, uh, I so it got me back into it. And it reminded me of how much I loved it. And it, and I think also what's been amazing for me is it because I do love it so much when I watch it and it gets carried away. That came comes across in my commentary. Mm. And everybody started to see me differently because they were like, oh, shit, because because of my past and the, the Marmite, Vegemite kind of effect I have on people. There was a lot of people who hated me. And I think the commentary actually turned them, a lot of them around because they were like, oh, wow, he genuinely loves and understands bike racing. So it's been an interesting exercise and, a, yeah, a bit of a trip. Oh, that's good, mate. Well, we, I want to wind the clock back a little bit. Uh, I said at the top of the show, you're a bit of a wordsmith. Um, you got far higher iq than myself uh, but looking at the research i did which was pretty much just looking at wikipedia um you went to school in hong kong um yeah t- tell me about your upbringing mate um and what was that like that experience you know hey this is you're like this or you know who else went to my school in hong kong michael hutchins did he really yeah did two was a year it? two years at kg5 did you know him no it was way before me yeah. Oh, you should have you should have just made it up and said, yeah, yeah, mate. Oh, no. yeah, we were mates. Chatting with him at the back. Oh yeah, yeah. Exactly. loads yeah. of time. Um, <laughs> yes, yeah, so I went to that was it. You no, know, I went to so in England we had a system called grammar school. Do you have that in in Australia? Sister schools. Yeah, well, grammar school it's called. It's so yeah. I went, I, mate, I went to the Gippsland Grammar School. Yeah, there you go. So that, I was yeah. I went to grammar school in the UK. I was with grammar school. I went and did yeah. a talk there actually we, recently. We, were you a prefect? Uh, you know, no, I left there. I was left there when I was. 12 13 and went to hong kong and that's when i went to kg5 then i was a prefect oh. there okay um, yeah I was, but, um, a, I was a i was a prefect as well i was the first prefect to get an after school detention for stealing sports dude, equipment dude seriously <laughs> so I, I, i'm glad you said that because I, I was the first prefect in the history of my school 80 years to have their prefectship taken away oh really <laughs> mate you've opened up a can of worms this is this has been a great interview yeah. what, what did you do i was with my um my best friend uh, and we were in that we were we were helping a junior disco that was going on after hours at school and my friend my other friend was DJing it and so we were bored so we went to our common room and it was a, it was a shithole of a common room and there were all these lockers and we just we had a football and we would like then there was we started playing football penalty shootout against the lockers mm. trying to kind of trying to hit certain people that were dickheads and trying to bang in their door and um and the deputy head walked in as we were doing it, and basically we got thrown out. And but the, the best thing was, is that 
by <laughs> Ruggiero to our, our common room where the canteen was next door. So he was, you know, the lights were out. And he's in there just sitting at a table, rolling a joint. And, uh, <laughs> and he's, he's here, he hears us like laughing and kicking his football. And he sees this guy come in, stomping. He's like, oh, fuck, and dies under the table. So it was me and two other friends, and we got caught. We got so we got suspended, and Ruggiero was with us. And he was like, dude, I feel so bad, man. Do you think I should just hand myself in? And then my other, my other friend, this is really good, his, his dad was a teacher at the school. And so we all left, went to the little McDonald's in Kowloon City. It's like super Chinese. And uh, we smoked the joint on the way, so we were pretty stoned by the time we got there. And then we just sat there at a table at a booth in McDonald's having milkshakes. And everyone was pretty quiet. And then Adam, my friend, who uh, his dad's a teacher, he just sort of, sort of piped up and he said, guys, on Monday in the meeting, do you think it will help if I break down and cry? <laughs> <laughs> like, no. Like, that oh, that's good. fantastic. Oh, yeah, it was awesome. Yeah, so, yeah. So, yes, yeah, so that's, that's what happened to my prefecture. Yeah. So, so what was um, school like in Hong Kong, though? Oh, it was cool. Yeah, I, I mean, I loved it. I, mean, I kind of turned up there as a straight A student and then and then kind of just sort of realized that this is a pretty unique time in my life. And and I loved it. I loved, I loved the whole time in Hong Kong and I knew it was finite. And so I just decided to, and I'd been a pretty quiet, shy kid, kept my own. I was very arty and, and sports and kind of just did lots of different things. But then I got to Hong Kong and I was like, you know what? I got into my biking more, skating, wakeboarding, art, still these different things and and just really loving it and going to parties for the first time and hanging out and and just soak it soaked it up. You ever you remember that what was it, Smashing Pumpkins video, nineteen seventy nine? Yeah, it's a great video. Watch that. That's basically what it felt like. It was like an American high school where it was just got to have so much fun and do so much cool stuff. And it didn't really set me up for life. In fact, it kind of probably put me back a few steps. But it was, um, but it was a, it was a, a once in a lifetime. It was just before the the Hong Kong hand, hangover. Uh, hangover. That's a Freudian Hangover. <laughs> yeah, handover. And it, so I guess the, the buzz in Hong Kong was just a, it was just crazy at that time. So yeah, it was a, a, a Hong Kong will always be a spiritual home for me, and uh, still my best friends are there. And and so you were there because your old man's a pilot, yeah. And yeah. Um, what are the perks back then of having a dad who's a, a pilot? Do you get free travel and things like that? Yeah, it was. I mean, that was the thing. I kind of all my school holidays came back to the UK. Um, could, could and you know, I mean, even the airline. Those the back days, the airline paid for the school. They kind of it was all expat, old school expat life where you were just spoiled, and it was. Um, yeah, no, it was cool. I mean, my dad had been a wing commander in the Royal Air Force. So I, and I guess that was one of the things I'd grown up in my whole life until I was 13, 12, 13 with, and, and I wouldn't say authoritarian, but uh, Scottish, I'd born in Malta, went to the north of Scotland. My earliest memories of playing and playing in RAF bases and in hangars as a kid. And it's during the Cold War and being with planes and climbing in planes. And, you know, it's all, it's like something that, it just seems surreal now when I look back. But I, with that came the fact that my dad, was a squadron leader, wing commander, parents got divorced, he went to Hong Kong and became an airline pilot. And all, all of a sudden, everything changed. It went from being a very traditional, if you like, kind of uh, trajectory as the life I was going as a military kid to Hong Kong. And it was like somebody turned the lights on. And I was like, oh, wow, the world's a totally different place. And that's when everything changed. Did you ever have the urges to go and become a pilot yourself? or? Yeah, I mean, I loved it. I, I knew every plane that existed. And when I was a kid and you know I just loved it I wanted to be a fighter pilot and I, I've still got this huge kind of military sort of obsession I mean I got two or three shelves up here which are just military books and it's um so it's, it's something that I guess and uh, you know my godfather's a royal marine it's actually yeah. can you see it up there I'm not sure you can see it uh, there's a yellow flag this is oh, yeah. super there you go that yellow yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. so yep, that was um so he was he was Major Mike Norman, and so when I was born in Hong Kong, uh, sorry M Malta, uh, there were no telephones in the little house, little adobe house my mum was living in, and the nearest neighbour was uh, Mike and his wife Thelma, and so he gave her that little flag, made it for her to f put when she went into labour because my dad was away flying during that week, two weeks, and it's the the Royal Marine insignia, which is a dagger on a yellow on a yellow flag. So it's just that I was kind of bored into that. And it's um, which I guess has been 
part of my success as well, my ability to kind of focus when I do need to and uh, enjoy discipline when it's available. Um, but otherwise, yeah, it's, I guess that's the kind of dichotomy of me. It's got that military upbringing and then that looseness of Hong Kong. Well, I was going to say, um, how did you then get into cycling? And, and then when did you realize, shit, I'm pretty fucking good at this? I, I kind of, I was one of those kids that didn't like school sports. So I was always doing alternative sports, BMX in the 80s and skating. And, and then when mountain biking, I was very fortunate to ride that wave of, of cycling booms. And it was BMX in their mountain biking. And I raced, it was like a nine-year-old, nine-year-old BMX, nothing special, but I didn't, you know, I didn't have all the equipment the other kids did. And I didn't really know what I was doing. But then I got a mountain bike and then I'd ride in Hong Kong and I did a couple of local races. And then I started to, re- when I started to ride, I had this group of friends I rode with and I just realized I was just so much better than any of them. And by doing the same, and I was like, this is really weird. And I've, I've always said, I, I realized that I discovered something and that I'd be an absolute fool not to pursue it because it was, I did so many different things and yet none of them did I have a kind of a step function increase in performance as I did with cycling constantly, just kept Mm. getting better. And I was like, this is super weird. And so then that, so I was mountain biking and then did that with some guys in Hong Kong who were older than me, who were actually road cyclists and they introduced me to Tour de France and books and back then it was just vhs videos that you kind of scabbed around to get some like a little column in a newspaper in the south china morning post some results or or the magazines velo news that was like two months late wrapped in polythene hmm. some some cult magazine shop in mong Kok. so it was kind of which is what i loved about it it seemed like this whole cult sport that was mm. huge that nobody knew about and and the more I read the books, and there weren't many at the time. Now it's a it's a whole literary genre, genre um, cycling, much like cricket or foot soccer or baseball. But um, but yeah, and I, I just fell in love with it. I thought I want to do that, and it made no sense because I'd never seen a professional bike race. Didn't know anybody who'd done it. Didn't have any. It wasn't part of my culture in any way. But it it, it captured my heart, and I was like, I'm going to go and do that. And I kind of liked the fact that it was just everyone just thought I was absolutely insane. It's different because um, you come into the sport, it's it's a really pure story. Like most of the other guys are like, oh, my dad rode or, you know, there's some sort of, I've got to follow in this path. Um, so then when did it transition? Like when did you get your first chance to go over to Europe and go, all right, well, now I want to set a goal. Like I want to be a pro. And what were your yeah. early sort of ambitions? Yeah, I mean, that kept, that was a two-edged sword for me because I no family, no no family member, be it father or older brother, which is very much the norm. Um, it meant that I did have a blank slate. Um, I didn't. I was living my own journey, and and so I, I went back, left Hong Kong, and I was supposed to be going. I was going back to art college where I had a place. But I, in my school holidays, the previous two years, I I didn't know anybody in England by this point because my mum had moved since I'd moved to Hong Kong. So she knew I was getting into cycling. So she joined me in a local cycling club. And when I was back, just to keep me busy and not getting bored, she'd take me to the local cycling club and I'd do time trials. And then they told me about road racing. So my mum would take me to road races and we had no idea what we were doing. And then I just, I started winning stuff and I was just, was loving it. I was loving learning about tactics and I got put on teams and, and then the national team spotted me when I was like 16, 17, just in one of my, in my second school holiday. And they took me under the, what there wasn't a wing then it wasn't like it is now and they just took me some races and that's when I started to think you know what I I kind of I'm really I really love this I love the racing I wasn't so big on all the other stuff the social side or um or just even training I just wanted I trained to race and then in my final year um uh, 18 in Hong Kong they put me which they'd never done before the year before they guaranteed me a place at the junior world championships because they knew I had my a levels and I was going to be away doing that for a year in Hong Kong and then come back and I could go straight to the worlds in the meantime I didn't train for a year I was like fuck this I'm just going to enjoy this last year in Hong Kong so I got back and and made a mockery of myself at the worlds and that was when I decided I put my I can remember stopping on the course in San Marino finding a spot and just crying and going you idiot it's like you're much better were you just embarrassed that you hadn't put the prep in i wasn't embarrassed i was um disappointed in myself i realized that i i was better than that and that i i and the thing was i hadn't just let myself down it's all cliche isn't it i'd let others down and i thought you idiot and so then i came out of there and i just went all guns blazing and i decided i went back and i 
started training really hard, went to tour and started winning stuff again. Then I went to Bel, I s spoke to my mum and told her, cause I only had by this point, only a month left till I was going to art college. And I said, look mum, I want to give this a go. I want to try and turn pro. And I said, I'm only going to give myself one year to turn pro. And because, so I'm going to defer my place at art college for one year. And if I'm not pro next year, I'll come back to art college. And she was like, okay, I said, but you're gonna have to get a job. So I got a job at a supermarket stacking shelves and did all this. And then I managed to get a place uh, through Paul Sherwin actually at a, uh, an amateur team in France. So I moved across there when I was 18, uh, just turned 19 actually to North France, uh, to this team called VC saint Quentin. Got my hectic kicked in for three weeks and then just started winning races. And I think by June that year, I had four or five professional teams wanting to sign me. And, and that was it. And it was, it was go time from then on in and I turned pro, signed my contract with Paul Sherwin actually. He came to the North of Francis local cafe with me um, to, to sign my first contract with Cofidis. And that was with Cyril Guimard. And that's when Lance Armstrong was on the team, Tony Romagam, Maurizio Fondriest. It was like the equivalent of having a, a team in your startup these days. It was so big. Um, unfortunately, it didn't quite pan out well. Um how big are mentors back in those days? Like, do you look back now and think, geez, if Paul Sherwin didn't bridge that gap or whatever, um, the, the path could have been different? Yeah, it's like sliding doors, isn't it? It's, it's butterfly effect. And it's, I mean, there's so many people on the journey. If you're on one of these journeys like this, where if you get the, the opportunity and you, you embrace it and you put the work in, which I did start to do hugely, uh, people start to believe in you. And if they believe in you, you believe in them. And it's like little, it's like each one of them gives you a, a hand up. They kind of give you a hand and they pull you up to the next step. And then often, once you get to that step, they can't help you get to the next step. But if you mm. then work hard and do the things like that on that level, then somebody else will reach down and pick you up to the next step. And I was very lucky that kept happening to me for numerous times where I kept getting that hand would reach down and pull me back up to the next one, pull me up to the next one. And then it was like, right, now it's over to you. You do this. And, it, and that's what it very much it comes down to. It comes down to you have to then respect the help you've been given. And the more you do that, the, the higher you'll go. And, and as every single one of those mentors, uh, those lift ups is important. And it just ends up being more and more important people, the higher you go, that help you. And that's been a, a wonderful journey in itself. Um, you look at the results you got, particularly in those early years, um, and did that all happen too quick? Like you're you you're winning stages at Tour of in '98, then you're winning the prologue at the Tour Tour de France in in 2000. You're wearing the yellow jersey. You're saying before, you know, you're training. You're realizing, shit, I'm better than these guys. Is this all just happening too fast? And did at some point it feel a little bit too easy? It never felt easy. Uh, it was definitely, everything was happening too fast. When I turned pro in 1997, I had no idea that doping was rife. And so that was a, a huge like devastation and, and realization. And from that moment on, and actually Cyril Guimard had wanted to keep me amateur until through 1997 and have me turn pro in 1998. But I refused because I was like, I can't do that. I'm not racing amateur again. And so I was already putting, I was already speeding it up and I wanted to do tour in 1999. They wouldn't let me because I was too young. So I went to a training camp and got drunk the last night because I was pissed off and jumped off a roof and broke my heel in half and wrote my whole year off. You know, so I was always, so I was kind of, I was my own worst enemy in many ways. Um, but at the same time, it was, none of that was being helped by the fact that the culture I was in was just, it was toxic. And, and the very nature of doping, it's acceleration. You're, you're just trying to speed things up. There, there's no culture of patience of uh, day by day of, I'll wait a few years till I mature when there's a doping culture because it's like the drugs will do that for you. And so mm -hmm. it, was a, it was very much a, um, I was in the right place at the wrong time. And so, and unfortunately that then started to change me. Do you think, like, this is one thing I've struggled from talking to various people is that whole era, um, when it all came out with Armstrong and um, people jumped to assumptions of they knew that or they thought it was a decision that a rider had, I'm either going to dope or I'm not going to dope, but they don't know the backstory in terms of there were so many managers that were saying to young um, riders that 
weren't ever experienced to any of this stuff and basically giving them a question that was either you get on this program uh, and we'll continue to race you at the big races or you you choose not to and we'll rip your contract up pretty much because mm. you know you're no good anyway or they fill your head mm. with doubt and then also this culture of um, to groom you to get used to needles and things will inject you with you know vitamins and, and normal stuff first but then that will program your brain to then get to a point where you go actually I'm still I'm used to needles I'm used to this routine do you feel that if people understood the whole culture, they would have had less likely to jump to conclusions, particularly when the Armstrong stuff came out. Yeah, yeah, you're bang on because uh, it's not it's not a um, it's, it's never black and white, and I think that's what people like to think is is black and white. It's not every single person's different. Every single uh, culture you come from. Uh, there's a great Somerset Mom quote, and it's um, I'll, I'll remember it later on and I'll recite it because it's about how we're all different and. Often, these managers, coaches, these older teammates, the, the teams you choose, the the way you're brought into it is is very much dependent on how they think they're going to do it. And as you said, it could be grooming, it could be rooming with other teammates, it could be just flat out talking to you about it and explaining the realities of life and watching you just go, okay. But it's um for each of us, uh, unfortunately, we found our own reasons why we did it. And often it was due to the entourage around us and the situation, the culture we came from and the, where we were living at that point. But it was never black and white. And that was the, that was the principal motivation actually for writing uh, Racing Through the Dark, my first book, was because I was just sick of this black and white attitude towards it and this lack of education. And, and the thing is, I don't blame people for that um, because there was no education. Nobody was telling the story. Nobody was explaining how it happened, what happened. So I figured by telling my story that it would help people see that it wasn't black and white. I mean, I mm. was purer than the driven snow. You know, it's, yeah, it's a bit loose at times like any kind of young dude is. But it was all the same time. I wasn't a doper. I abhorred it. I thought it was disgusting. I had horrible disdain for it. Uh, to the point in 1999, I flew up to see the CEO of Coffee's, which is a huge company, and have lunch with him at his office to tell him I refused to race with Frank Vandenbroek and Philippe Gaumont because I knew they were doping and they were a huge bad influence. And so, you know, and that's even doing that, they wouldn't fire them because, but I would then, I had to go and fight my right with the CEO of our title sponsor to say, I'm not going to succumb to this. And yet, you know, two years later, I'm doing it. So it, it's it's never a flick of a switch. It's a wearing down, and it's a and as you said, it's a normalization. And for mm. me, it was a it was a grooming and a normalization. And eventually, that's why uh, I, I ended up doping, and eventually getting caught and admitting. And then, and then the motivation really to come back was to prevent it happening to a younger version of myself by being honest and, and proving that it's possible to win clean and then eventually writing, writing racing through the dark and doing all the other stuff. Was it quite a cathartic experience writing that book and yeah. um, telling your yeah. side of the story? No, no, it wasn't. Uh, everyone always asked me that, actually, so it, was just a, <laughs> it was a very normal question to ask. But it's at the same time, I, the, the trauma I'd been through regards, kind of, I'd been arrested. I'd, I'd already admitted dozens of times. I'd admitted to police. I'd admitted to my team. I'd admitted to journalists. I'd admitted to my family. I'd admitted to my friends. Uh, and it had all been public domain. Um, and it was five years later, no, actually it was 2011, winter of 2010, that I wrote Racing Through the Dark. So that's six years after I was arrested. And actually Racing Through the Dark was just a hugely technical exercise. Uh, it was, and any, if you write a book, then it's the old saying, it's the, you, you sit there and you bleed at the typewriter. There's, mm. there's, nothing, there's nothing healthy about the process if you're doing it properly. And, and yeah, and it's not, so the catharsis came it's, you know, I don't think it's, anything's ever been cathartic. And I don't, I've got this theory on, on catharsis in the sense that it, if you, there is, this, and it probably, maybe it's the old Scottish Protestant in me, and I'm not a religious person, but just in general human behavior, if you've done something wrong and you know it was wrong, it's a regret you're always going to live with. Now, and that regret in theory then fuels you to learn and those lessons are then what you transmit 
and you try and share in order to prevent it happening again. And that's not something that should ever end because that's your duty to then continually do that. And you can, you can justify that in different ways. And the, the easiest at the beginning, it was to stop it happening to a younger rider like me again. And then it kind of transfers to other younger riders or any riders of the sports as a whole. And then you get to a point where I've got children where it's to make sure my children never have to go through that again. But it's that kind of, it's not something where, ah, oh, I'm healed. It's, mm. um, it's not like that, sadly. I would wish it was. That'd be much nicer. So what, what advice do you have? Because you look at the current situation. I mean, here in Melbourne, we, we had um, two ex-professional athletes uh, commit su- suicide in the last week. Um, people are really, really struggling across the board. Um, and you talked about you went through some pretty dark periods. Um, how do you get out of those periods? How do you get out when things on paper are looking pretty grim? Um, you know, do you, what did you draw on to, to get out of those dark periods after yeah. sort of around the 2004, 2005 period? Um, yeah, so, you know, funny enough, I did a TED talk in February this year, which is very much around that. And the title was Creativity Within Crisis. And, and I talked about within that is one of the hardest things is when you're in that, that dark place is the sense that it feels like you're falling and it feels and you get to that point of just you're always looking down, trying to work out when it will stop. And, and that's the worst time because it's an unknown. You know, there's, there's just you're just waiting to hit the bottom. And then and part of the fear becomes in that kind of that unknown of how you're going to get out of this darkness and if you ever will. And I guess it's that recognition that it's, it's going to get really bad. And then sometimes it gets that real super bad place. And then you've got to hope. And I think this is what it is. You've got to hope that you've got people around you that that see it, that love you, that that will help you. Because it's at that point when you're at your lowest, you've got to try and look up and just find a tiny ray of light. And at that point, it's the biggest decision you ever make is just to stand up. And then you start to do it kind of just one step at a time. And it takes a really long time. And it's a but once you start kind of going in the opposite direction, you start looking up rather than looking down, it the, the the joy is in that journey because mm-hmm. man i had nothing when i rebooted and i was v- vilified i'd lost everything yet i fell back in love and cycling because it was all so simple again and and i had a i had a point to prove and i think that's very much it. and i think also just going back and that's it's, it's a convoluted way the ted talk was much better but um <laughs> no, <laughs> but, I, I, I was into it i thought you did a really good job yeah. um but um but uh regards to the athletes it's a funny thing with this with because the majority of us go with it, especially if you've done it for a long time. Um, and there's no point in going, I don't think it's the kind of the th- classic therapy thing works with this, trying to explain it, because you can't. Mm. I think a lot of it has to do with um, actual just brain chemistry. Yep. It's when you spend years basically kind of addicted to dopamine and just, and the, the biochemical reactions that your body because your body and, and mind are completely connected. And if you suddenly kind of stop and you start slipping, then you come into that negative cycle of not doing sports. And then it becomes this really, and the amount of times you hear, and we say in everyday times, healthy body, healthy mind. And I think for, for athletes, it's, it's even more because you spent a majority of your life dependent on that, that body mind connection. And then we just stop. And all of a sudden, our, our brain chemistry completely changes, and we manage it badly. And we'll lean to drugs, and we'll lean. To, and we've already got addictive personalities because that's why we became so good, because we were, we were obsessive, we were addictive, we were we were driven. Um, and so you've got to find ways of replacing that. And probably an easy way, obviously, is alcohol or drugs or whatever or antidepressants. So you'd actually you've got to find a way of getting your body working again, and and finding and once again finding that goal. That, as I said, that kind of whatever it is, just aim for something. So I want to move on to um, the Garmin uh, project in its early days. I don't think people actually give it enough credit for for what it did and the changes that it uh, – widespread changes that it had for the sport of cycling. Um, what was the initial approach? Um, who, who reached out to who and how did all that come about? And what was the, the goals in those early days of, of really trying to change the sport? Yeah, it's a really random one, actually. So it was at the 2006 Tour de France presentation in Paris in October. And um, 
I turned up there as I was invited and uh, Jonathan Waters is an ex-American racer who I hadn't seen in years. He was a quirky kind of weird dude. Um, but we'd always got on when we raced because he was just like so different. And he was there and I was like, hey, David. And I was like, hey. And I was like, what are you up to? And he's like, oh, yeah, I'm here. I'm starting this new team. And this American, Doug, and he's, a bit of, he's over there. He's like, he's, I think he's going to fund this whole team and we want to do something completely different. And I was like, oh, that's cool. And, and he said he hasn't got a ticket. He can't come in. So I'll sort him out a ticket. So it's because I knew everybody. So I just went and got him a ticket. And then I was speaking to Doug. And I had no idea because I knew that Jonathan had this little uh, amateur junior team, TIA Cref, in Colorado. And then with Doug, he had this vision to create this um, uh, very much like me because Jonathan was an ex doper, but he hadn't let's call it an opportunity to to come out of the doping closet, if you like. He was still unknown. But he wanted to make sure that American guys would have, young Americans would have a, a, a vehicle to race in Europe that would not involve doping. Um, and so Doug believed in this. And he, Doug is a very wealthy man and he was willing to bankroll it. And so I came on, I started chatting because I was fascinated because I was on my mission at, at that time of trying to change the sport. And Jonathan, with his, he has his faults like we all do, but he had this absolute insight that if he was going to start a clean team, and really for it to have uh, proper validity, the best captain, best leader of that team would be an ex-doper who was, as you said, on this journey of redemption and willing to talk about it. And, and, it, and it, was, it was really astute because I then came on uh, onto this, what we then called the, the clean team. Slipstream was our original because we didn't even have a sponsor. Mm -hmm. And I then spent the whole of 2007 recruiting people. So I was the first signing. And with that signing, I came on as part owner as well. So I was a part owner of the team, which was pretty unprecedented as well, and um, which gave me certain. Uh, but I hope as a part owner, you don't take on the debt. <laughs> exactly. That, 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 that would suck. That. <laughs> that's what I yeah, good stuff. <laughs> I know, yeah. Right. That's what I thought. Hmm. Yeah. This, could go, this could go very wrong. Um, but... Uh, but yeah, and then so I, and I went around the kind of Christian Vanderveld, um, Ryder Hezjadal, Magnus Backstead at the time, Julian Dean, Dave Zabriskie. We had this real kind of motley crew of, um, uh, they were all kind of outlier riders within the European peloton at the time. And I was the, I managed to convince Christian Vanderveld and Dave Zabriskie to leave CSC, like the world's best team at the time, and come to this mm. startup stream team. And that was my main reason. And the point was, we're going to do something different. And this is going to be really cool and we've got the means and let's do so. And part of and what I did as well, which is probably why over a hundred people live in Girona and cyclists live here, hundred pros, is I wanted the whole team to live in uh, Girona because I'd learned during my band when I'd uh, been based in the UK where the British cycling team was, uh, so Dave Brailsford took me under his wing, um, was that that was a huge deterrent to doping culture because by having everybody live in the same place outside of races, you they couldn't hide stuff so easily because that was part of the fundamental cultural problem with professional cycling was that people would race uh, together but then disappear to their their hideaways and mm. uh, where they'd kind of have their a totally separate life often and so the part of the, the drona kind of plan was of having the whole team and slipstream team living here with our hq with as many riders as we could here was create a a, a network that would offer security and trust and also uh, allow us to and show that you're always part of the team and mm. that you had a responsibility if you did something wrong you were taking all of us down and we all live here together and it was um and that's then what kind of started that that all the other pros starting to move here because we had so many of us and then with the racing it was amazing we we had such a camaraderie because we, we we had and now i kind of also work in brand and business and marketing now we had such a purpose we were determined to prove everybody wrong that we could mm. do this, that we could win clean, that we and we were, we were beating people, you know, and we'd win team time trials and and we were marginal we were marginal gaining. So a lot of the things we kind of we say the team sky brought that in. We were doing all of that. We were doing crazy stuff, science and kind of mad stuff and huge altitude training camps and crazy equipment and trialing things and wonderful uh, coaching and it was it was a magical team. And you getting back to a couple of things. Um, one, how good is it being able to create a culture from the start? I mean, Green Edge went through a similar thing, but you can literally shape what you want and you're not inheriting something. So that must have been a real um, fun element for you. Yeah, yeah, it was. And I think it's, um, 
as you say, because we're, we're stuck in the cycling with uh, the rules and especially kind of, you know, when I turned around Cofferty's, you weren't allowed to use the air conks, you might catch a cold, you know, and it's like, and there were all these, just so many old rules that you had to adhere to. And yet with Slipstream, we were writing our own rules. And it was, um, and it felt like, and it was, there's a Paul Smith saying, it's like, don't be scared to break the rules. And mm. that's not saying actually break the law, but we, we have so many societal rules that aren't beneficial. And so I think that's, I think that's what you mean. I, I agree with you 100%. Creating that culture, which is essentially breaking the rules, is creating a new culture is, is such a joy. And that's such, that offers that purpose I was talking about. Um, I used to love chatting with Whitey about um, some of the old stories, particularly the ones about the team bonding camps. Um, yeah. and, and the thing is, you know, you know what's funny is it sort of goes in waves. Like they start thinking, no, 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 you've got to go back to treating these athletes like robots and we've got to be real serious and we've got to do it this way. And it's frowned upon if you all get together and have a drink or whatever. Looking back at some of those camps, I mean, the best one was when you went to the, some island um, that was on they came someone's. In. They came in Ireland. That's it. Um, I think, I think oh, most okay. of you, most of your yeah. team, come down with um, alcohol poisoning. But you look at what effect those camps yeah. have on for building chemistry. And oh. then when you're all, you know, wanting to get results in a team time trial, do you think that modern day cycling sort of overlooks the importance of things like that? Yeah, I think so. I mean, obviously perhaps not to the extreme we would do it at, but it was, um, <laughs> yeah, I do. I, I mean, I believe so. Cause I, I'd always, I'd always kind of joke, laugh a bit when they try and put these team bonding exercises in, which were kind of corporate team bonding exercises, because there's a part of it that's like, dude, we do the biggest, we've got the most incredible team bonding exercises in the world. They're called races. And it's kind of to try and replicate that. And it, it's, it doesn't feel real. But as you say, there's that other side of, Creating that, and it, it is, it's a very male thing, I think, to kind of do those things where you just go and get smashed together because there's an honesty that comes out that doesn't otherwise. And a lot of the time it's good honesty. And then there's also the kind of the next day, there's sort of camaraderie in that we fucked up. And you all have to, <laughs> <laughs> you all kind of have to stick together. Uh, I reckon there was a few of those moments <laughs> looking around the room going, oh, mate, seriously. Oh, Oh, yeah, too far, man. Good thing there's no internet reception here. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so another good random story Whitey told me was um, a, a guy by the name of Nigel Dick. Come, was it? Yeah. Did he come to the tour? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this guy, do you want to give a bit of a backstory and then your relationship with him? Because I was fascinated, being obviously in the film TV uh, industry. Yeah. So, so Nigel Dick is essentially the the king of music videos. Um, in the 1980s and 90s, especially in the 90s, he was the go-to. I mean, he's done Guns N' Roses, November Rain. He's done Britney Spears, uh, her first one. I can't remember what it was. Uh, hit me, baby, one more time. Well done, Dan. I, I yeah. think. <laughs> Bit too quick off the mark. Uh, <laughs> but um, so, yeah, most of the videos from the 1990s, Oasis, he, yep. he was the go-to for all the big record companies and his CV says, insane but he's also psyched and um and so he'd kind of john he, he'd reached out to jonathan about maybe just doing something to help him with slipstream at the beginning and he did a promo video with me at our first camp to kind of explain the backstory it's a sort of launch video for, for the slipstream but then he came with us on a on the tour de france in 2000 and oh was it eight or nine maybe i can't remember but on one of them is actually there's a couple of videos on youtube if you look up um actually the miller's tale it's called um, which is a little bit. I was going to say, don't search Nigel Dick because you might you might yeah. get a few other ones, but um, be specific. It, Nigel Dick, David Miller. It's yeah, gonna work. yeah, yeah, that'll work. But um, yeah, and it's, it was brilliant. So he would um, and we let him in. And again, this is kind of before. God, it's so crazy when you think about it. Nowadays, we're also kind of accustomed to those videos, which are pretty intimate. Either it's from individuals with their instagram uh, stories or whatever tiktok now or and even just youtube stuff but in 2008 2009 no one was really doing that behind the scenes stuff mm. kind of uh, which you then obviously turned into a whole different genre which was much improved but back then it was a lot of the stuff we were doing with garmin and part of our mission with slipstream as it was then garmin was to um be transparent was to because up to then because of the doping culture teams were very secretive 
it's you, people didn't want cameras in their rooms they didn't want so that was even if you were clean you didn't because it was just part of the culture and so a slipstream we very much broke the mold with that and and really let people in nigel dick was was fantastic i mean nigel even came to me he did my our wedding video which was oh, amazing well wow. <laughs> I know, he's a legend. I love my Did you do a choreographed um, dance move oh, at the end or anything like that? We should have done. Wigo was singing. But yeah, <laughs> jumping Jack Flash. But yeah, no, no. So it was, um, yeah, and that was a very much a slipstream vibe. We were just bringing that whole kind of new, that new thing, which is easy to forget. And as you said, and I think when you said at the beginning, I feel that Garmin kind of people don't recognize what we did. I mean, I don't think so. And I think we forget as well. Because it's very well, quickly I, normalized. I think one of the big ones was the um, biological passport. I think that all came about because of Garmin. Um, yeah, that's, I mean, you know, just normal exactly. today. So we had our own in house biological passport, which the team dug. It was costing him 350000 US dollars a year for us to have our own biological passport within our team that we monitored ourselves. So, and that was always something that I, and I, I, when I came back from my band and was coming back in, I said, no one has the right to say they didn't know. And team bosses who say they didn't know. And mm. so with Slipstream, we wanted to prove if where there's a will, there's a way. You know, we're going to take responsibility for that. We're going to say we're 100% clean. And you know what we're also going to do? We're going to let you in 100% transparency to the media. We're going to create our own anti-doping program, which is a biological passport, which, as you said, did serve as the case study for the actual UCI uh, biological passport. And we really did just break down barriers. And it was, um, and it, that was the proof. And the ultimate proof of concept, regardless it was, was that we could show that we could do it. But also it did then bring in the first corporate sponsor into cycling than we'd had in years because Garmin came in, uh, Garmin HQ. And this is going, and this is why I said it was so rare. Normally it's almost a borderline philanthropy when somebody sponsors a cycling team. But Garmin came in at a board level. They decided because we were getting articles in the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times. And these were articles that I was doing with everybody and these stories and these videos. And people were like, wow, they're doing something really different. And let's back them. Let's support this. We believe in it. And we were almost giving a contract to to these sponsors that we were doing. We were going to stay clean, and it was. Uh, it and it turned into as ever. It, it turned into an economic model that other teams started to to replicate. So, as I said earlier, do you think that people fully um, appreciate that side of things with the Garmin when when people look back at um, those formative years? No, I don't think so. I think because we just because we because we did have fun. And because we were quite quirky and with the Argyle and JV is the, the kind of the, the, the ringleader and me as the, the kind of the road captain and, and race leader and Zabriskie and all these different people, I think. And I guess that was part of the strategy. It kind of, in the sense, we didn't realize it was a strategy. It was because we were genuinely having fun. So mm. although we were doing this really kind of cool, innovative stuff and we were breaking down barriers, we were just... We were having such fun while we were doing it. And I think, thankfully, I think people do look back and go, that just looked like a cool team. You guys were having fun. But actually, behind that, that was built off a huge amount of work and mm. a huge amount of dedication to a cause. Um, and as I said, I think we were having fun because we all truly, we, we were so, the camaraderie was immense because of that purpose and that mission to do what we were doing. And, and we just, we were outliers. And, um, and it's, I don't think it'll ever happen again. Um, you were talking about um, behind the scenes videos. I think Beyond the Peloton was the series that you guys did. That was fantastic. That um, uh, yeah, that, that you know what that that that's that spread into us. That was actually um, uh, that was Joe Finkelman. That's uh, it, Joe Finkelman. He was actually doing the Savello test team, and then when they came across, they did a couple with us, I think. But yeah, Joe was doing some really cool stuff. Oh, that's yeah. right. When you merged, yeah. Yeah, Sorry. yeah, Savella test team. So Savella test team, again, took it up a notch from that kind of idea of what we were doing. Yeah. Um, those, those BTS films were really kind of, they were super cool. Um, fast forwarding a bit, um, how did you go um, when you got to the back end of your career when you knew sort of retirement was imminent. I know you were doing a, a documentary and, and so forth at the time. How was that period for you knowing, all right, well, things are sort of going to wrap up now? Were you sort of already forward thinking, all right, these are the next steps post uh, cycling? What was your mindset mm -hmm. like? I tell you, what, it, was, it, was, it was weird, Dan, because I, I mean, I love, my, from when I came back, I just had a, a total renaissance and I fell back in love with bike racing and and I was all guns blazing right into 2012. And then 
I just, the lights just started to kind of flicker. You know, I'd had this burning flame since I'd come back in 2006. And then I just noticed that the kind of that flame was sort of dimming. And I was like, oh, shit, I don't, I'm not loving this quite so much anymore. The training. And I think it was actually in direct correlation to our first son being born and Archibald. And I didn't like leaving home. I didn't, didn't kind of have that same, well, basically the same fire burning, kind of a, a sort of diluted slightly and wanted to put more into Archie. And and then I was then I had to start thinking, well, Christ, this isn't going to last much longer now, is it? And this is always, I think, this is always one of the interesting thing with athletes. The vast majority of athletes is the decline and fall is so fast. It's mm. you know, it's such a the ascending spiral is is pretty long, and if you're lucky, you get a nice plateau. But the decline and fall is poor. Oh, it's brutal, and it's and you we're not prepared for it. We we don't have. Um, a union or a culture that that uh, educates regards reconversion um and i actually prefer to use the term rehabilitation because it's a total shift going from being a essentially a professional athlete from a teenager to stopping 15 years later and going into the what are definitely compared to professional athlete world the real world this mm. you're not prepared none of us are prepared and so I kind of started thinking, well, what am I going to do? I said, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to work in the pro bike racing world because I've had the best job in it and I can't see anything else in it that I'd like to achieve. And so I, I had to think about what I was going to do. And that's when I came up with this idea of creating a brand, doing something and going back to that kid who'd wanted to go to art college and was very creative and do something, apply all those lessons I'd learned over those 18 years that, in not only the actual kind of just be a bike racer and leader and but also the product development and the kind of the, the the that kind of those breaking down barriers doing things differently and hey so that's where the idea of this brand chapter three came up and um, and that's been my kind of passion project ever since then and so is, is chapter three the essence of it um it's cycling clothing but there's more of a narrative be behind the the products yeah very much. I mean, we started off obviously as because I, I basically reverse engineered it in the sense that I um, never took funding on board. Uh, I went to these great partners that I'd worked with for many years, like Castelli um, and Park and uh, Brooks, who I'd worked with because of their part of Physique, and explained to them that I had this idea that I, I wanted to continue working with them as I had done for so long, because I was always the person in the team that worked with their product developers. Um, and I said, I want to start creating things that I'll use on racing life. Um, but I said, I don't want to use my name. I don't want it to be because I knew I was a depreciating asset, uh, as all athletes are. From the moment you stop, you're, you're replaced very quickly and your, your name uh, slowly dissolves and fades. So I thought I need to come up with something new. And so the chapter idea was because I thought everyone kept asking my, my last year, what's the next chapter? And I was like, I don't know, I'm working on that. And then I thought, well, actually, chapter, th it is what it's called, chapter. And then I was like, well, can't do that because that won't work as a trademarking, et cetera. And then I was like, well, it's not my second chapter, it's chapter three, because I have my doping band in the middle and it's very much a career of two halves. And this feels like the third part of my life. And that's where you go to the narrative, because I do believe that, and that's where I've had to learn so much in the last few years about what building a company is, what building a brand is. And it's not, I don't want it ever to be just one thing. I want it to be lots of things. I want it to become more of an idea. And I do believe we all have a next chapter. And I kind of like this idea that the third chapter is that like a third act in a narrative where it's the resolution, it's the conclusion. And this is something I want to just do for decades now. I spent my whole life kind of doing things short term, medium term, whereas chapter three is this long term project where I want to be able to create a brand that can inspire people to to ride bikes, to do other sports eventually, to to kind of supply them with the products they need and to, to create kind of beautiful marketing and that actually inspires them to, to own it and use it. And so chapter three is a real big project that I, I think as of next year, I'm gonna kick off even bigger in the sense that up to now we've just catered for what I knew, which was men's apparel and the contacts I had, whereas next year I want to bring in women's apparel, then bring in for juniors and then start to actually do all different disciplines in cycling road mountain bike and that's because also it's become i've all, i'm a big believer that really good brands and companies are a, a diffusion of the person who's the the kind of the founder of the believer because I, i'm the one that drives it and all i do now is i mountain bike i 
I road ride very little. I gravel. I ride with my kids. I use my full my Brompton and cities. I run. I and so I thought, well, I want chapter three to be able to supply all of those things and kind of uh, carry that vibe. You're saying that uh, as a writer, you know, you've got addicted personalities, and it's all about you know winning and results and all that. Does this next chapter give you the same thrills um, as it did when you were racing? Yeah, I mean it does, uh, but at the same time as that that kind of that startup quote, it's like when you're starting a, a company and brand, it's equivalent to standing on the edge of an abyss chewing glass, which is kind of what it feels like at the moment. <laughs> and it's because it's a it's a big jump going from being a professional bike racer to running a company and, and creating a brand and and uh, the journey's been is amazing and it's it's been what I what I hoped it would be about kind of my personal growth as much as anything else but it's it's the challenges are, are huge I mean it's it makes my cycling career feel like a I, again I look back at it so such nostalgia now <laughs> that <was> so <laughs> this is really hard <laughs> yeah. but, it's, um, but it, I mean and, and I guess that's as you said that's the addictive Kind of person, I, I enjoy that. I enjoy that kind of that that fear and that challenge and the kind of and also the fact that this I kind of I want to show that it's not impossible to do this. I kind mm. of a, I'm a big believer in in trying to prove people and I, they're not proving people wrong, but prove people what's possible because I think a lot of people would think it's impossible to because I don't think any other cyclists or many few, very few athletes have ever built a brand a successful brand not using their name post career. And I'm finding that that's what I'm enjoying is trying to actually create an idea that I disappear into the background of. Mate, uh, it's been an unbelievable chat. Like I've I've really enjoyed it. And the thing is, I haven't even got a beer in my hand. Normally, you I know, know. I'm about six stubbies deep by about now, and it gets real deep. Um, <laughs> we'll do before- another one. We can we can do another one. A, a drunk call, and that'll be amazing. Our philosophy call. That that will go viral. Um, <laughs> And I was going to ask you about, you know, when you worked on the feature film, the program, and all this sort of stuff, but um, I'd rather um, finish off on, you know, you you do a bit of stuff with junior cyclists and, um, you know, it's all about taking the lessons that you've learned. What do you want to leave people with um, in terms of what are the key things that you think that you've learned from all the highs and lows of your journey um, for the people watching or listening, um, particularly, as I said earlier, like it's, it's a pretty shit period in the world at the moment. Um, What's the final message you want to leave people with? You know, it's this it's weird one because one that I was um, that I was taught when I was eight or nine by my grandma. My grandma, it was my my father's mother. Everyone hated her. She was like because she was just an absolute witch. She loved me though for some reason, and I was with her in Glasgow, and um, and I, I was left with her for a couple of days. So I can't remember why. And one day we we're walking along, and she she took me aside and we sat on a bench. And she never did anything like this. And she said, David, I want you to believe something. I don't want you to ever forget this. And I was like, what? And she was like, nothing is impossible. And she said, people are going to tell you that throughout your life. Don't believe it. And that's something that's always stuck with me. And I, the weirdest thing happened kind of, this is only last year. And it's why I then ended up basing my whole TED talk around was I was with my boys putting them to bed. And one of them, they were playing around and I was talking, oh, that's it. I got this beautiful photograph, large format photograph in the wall of the bedroom of Earthrise. You know, a fantastic image of Earth rising over the moon's horizon. And uh, and I was talking to them about it and when it was taken. And I said, you know, one day boys, you might stand on the moon. And, and one of them said, Daddy, that's impossible. Mm. And I, I said, come here, sit next to me. And I sat them down either side of my bed. And I said exactly what my grandma had said to me. And I said, boys, I want you to remember this. Nothing is impossible. It's you can do anything, and don't believe it when people tell you that. And you could just see their faces light up. And I thought that's. And now they say it all the time. Whenever somebody says impossible, or one of them says impossible, it's the other one. The other one will go. Nothing's impossible. Mm. And, it's, and I just think it's such a it's such a lovely idea. And of course, things are impossible, but they don't have to be. And I think that's. And it's such a, a wonderful. And I've, I've really started. The moment I start believing things are impossible, everything goes wrong. Mm. And if you don't try. If you don't make those first steps, if you don't kind of go for it, then yeah, it's always going to be impossible. So mm. yeah, I suppose that's why I'd leave you with. That's awesome, mate. There's an old saying: uh, if the sky's a the limit, then why are there footsteps on the moon? There you, there you go, go. Uh, mate. As I said, it's been uh, absolutely riveting. 
Um, I can't wait for the the next chat, as you as you mentioned earlier. Uh, it's good to see you doing well. And um, if people want to get any of the Chapter 3 uh, merch, can we get it online? Yeah, chapter3.com. So, there you go. There you go. Perfect, mate. Um, amazing, amazing journey, mate. I've really enjoyed it. And, and thanks for being on backstage. Uh, if you enjoyed this chat, guys, uh, make sure you subscribe and download and tell your mates. And uh, yeah, we'll see you again on, a, on another episode and speak to you soon. Miller, bloody awesome, thanks, mate. Man.